you come up with something that looks different. At this point, we're going to get rid of most of this, so you don't need to memorize it. But this one has a hydrogen dependence for the first time. If you keep going down and you move yourself to the second hydrogen addition, you get something that has a first order dependence in hydrogen. And those are your possibilities. If you look at the experimental data, and by the way, this is on an iron-based catalyst, as we will see in a moment. It is run at about 230 degrees Celsius and relevant pressures. It is an extremely active and very selective iron-based material. What we find is that the CO partial pressure dependence looks laminaria, as this would indicate, and the hydrogen dependence is first order. And that means that at least as far as this analysis is concerned, we can be comfortable with this mechanism. And as a matter of fact, I think most of us would accept this as being a reasonable mechanism. It agrees with the experimental data, and I thought it was the right one. Now, we begin to, um, to ask a few questions. On hydrogen-based catalysts, there are two ways that you can remove the oxygen. One is by hydrogen and one is by CO. And that means that if we think now about the oxygen removal selectivity, in other words, here is an O on the surface that was formed on that step, and we ask it, how are you going to come off the surface? You can count the number of waters and the number of CO2s that come out of your reactor, and you can sort of judge what is the competition between hydrogen and CO for that model. And this set of elementary steps and the appropriate assumptions that give rise to that rate expression actually will tell you what that is. That will be something that will increase with hydrogen to the one half power, and it will go as one over the carbon monoxide pressure. This is something that we can measure, this is something that we can expose internally. We now have a prediction for what the oxygen selectivity would be in one of those catalysts, and it will look roughly like that. <coughs> this is the hydrogen effect, and this is the CO effect. Well, since we can measure it, you say, why don't you go measure it? And the reason is that it's actually not very straightforward to measure. Because there's various ways by which you can make CO2 and water. One of them is by making it through the primary reaction of that oxygen with the two species that I told you. The other one is by having either the water or the CO2 come back again. And then you begin to, to do something called water gas shift. What you really want to do is you want to extract the primary rays at which you form CO2 and water by effectively taking your data as a function of residence time in that reactor, analyzing it as an approach to equilibrium type equation, and begin to actually measure the primary part of this chemistry as you change the hydrogen partial pressure and as you change the CO partial pressure. This is the primary CO2 formation rate. You can do the same thing with the water part of the chemistry and get to that number. Change, keep the hydrogen constant, change the CO pressure, and you begin to get now data that you can begin to match with your expectation. If it matches your expectations, then everything will be okay. Well, when you begin to look at the primary CO2 formation rate as a function of inlet partial pressure of CO, you acquire an inconsistency. And the inconsistency is that you don't really expect this to increase in this manner as a result of that, um, uh, of that change. If you look at the primary CO2 formation rate, as you change now the hydrogen pressure here, you find out that the hydrogen formation rate is independent, of the CO2 formation rate is independent of hydrogen pressure. Now to look at the kinetics of those two from what I've given you here would be quite all right, but since I already placed in your mind the idea of oxygen selectivity, what I want to do is I want to go back and take all this data and give it to you now in terms of oxygen selectivity. So what I will do, is I will look at the rate of this reaction, the, the CO2 formation as a function of CO, the rate of CO2 formation as a function of hydrogen, do the same thing with the water part of the chemistry, and see whether this mechanism that assumes competitive reaction between hydrogen and CO without oxygen will actually give you the expected oxygen selectivity. And just to remind you what that oxygen selectivity is, it is supposed to look like that. Well. So if, if you begin to, um, to, to look at, at this data in this manner, what you will find out is that this kind of behavior is not consistent with what we find experimentally. The ratio of this two will not give you this kind of behavior. But let's look for a moment about at how we got to those two. We got it by saying that this chemistry occurred in this manner, right? So we said we dissociate the CO, the CO begins to form species that begin to hydrogenate it. We can get the right rate expression, and we get something here that does not agree 
with the experimental data from the oxygen selectivity. The other possibility is that you have something that has been proposed before in the literature, and that is that it's terribly difficult to just go on dissociate CO, but that there's some system that is required, especially on highly covered surfaces as this one's are, in order to be able to activate the CO. And the way that that goes is that hydrogen attaches itself to the CO first, weakens now the carbon-oxygen bond, and either immediately or by a second attack by hydrogen, you then go and dissociate that bond. And that then what happens as a result of that is that you will form water. Now, notice that in this path, there is the almost exclusive formation of water in a primary path. In other words, there is no oxygen that is ever left behind on that surface that will be picked up by anything except the hydrogen that will react with it. In this case here, you have the possibility that the oxygen that has been put on that surface will actually be picked up by either. Here you have set up the chemistry so as to form a hydroxyl and you're on your way to work. Here you have placed an oxygen on that surface and then you expect molecules to compete. Which one should win? CO should win because it is covering most of the surface. Well, and then you draw the chains. Now I'm going to ask you uh, to, for a moment, to look at what the hydrocarbon formation rate would look like if I had both of this path going on in parallel. And I'm going to make an additional um, assumption, well, not an assumption, but I'm going to tell you that this term right here is the one that effectively goes by this mechanism. Notice that this term is actually consistent with the experimental data. This is first order in hydrogen, and at high coverages of CO, is negative order in CO. So just this path is not inconsistent with the rate expression that we found. This one here is the one that goes by a rate determining step, that is the unassisted CO dissociation, where this is the rate determining step. And you saw this one in my second or third slide when I told you that one has no hydrogen dependence. Now we're going to have to do something else. And that is, I'm going to make the additional assumption that everything that goes through here is predisposed to form water. And that everything that goes through here is predisposed to form CO2, because you have an oxygen, and it's surrounded by CO on that surface, and see whether I can now reconcile the outcome of that, of that assumption with what we find experimentally. What you will find is, if this gives you water and this gives you CO2, you would expect that as you change the CO partial pressure, there will be no change in the ratio of water to CO2, and you will expect this linear dependence with hydrogen. And the question is not what you find experimentally. And that is, for any of the data sets that we have looked at, this is what we find experimentally. And that is that this selectivity for hydrogen taking away the oxygen is independent of CO. And this one right here is first order in CO. So the proposal is at least consistent with something that was inconsistent before with any mechanism that did not handle the hydrogen-assisted part of the chemistry. Now, what we're going to find in the case of iron is that iron forms both water and CO2. So there's going to be contributions from the two terms that I showed you earlier. The ratio of those two terms is exactly given by this selectivity that I showed you here. Now, this is very difficult to demonstrate in any sort of experimental way. If anybody has a good idea of what I should show you next, in order to convince you that this is going on, all I have to do is refer you back to a very large body of literature that effectively wasn't able to bring any additional proof for this particular statement. Yes, in the absence of reaction at lower temperatures, you can see some oxygen and hydrogen containing intermediates, but this is only a kinetic reason that effectively led us to this conclusion. The only way to begin to look at this in any more detailed way is by realizing that 10 years ago there were simulations that one could not do and they may be doable today. So we want to see whether there is an inconsistency between the proposal, which agrees with the data, and simulations of what CO would do on a surface. The surface that we're going to choose is an iron surface. Even though the actual catalyst is likely to be a carbide, the surface of those carbides clearly is going to have to have enough coordinate bond saturation to be metallic in nature and be able to do CO absorption chemistry. So what we're going to do is we're going to put CO and hydrogen on that surface, and we're going to ask it, what do you do? Well, what you do is you absorb, and you can measure computationally, the heat of absorption of CO and hydrogen in this manner. The next thing that you do is you ask CO whether it should dissociate or not. And when you do that, you get a dissociation activation energy, which is quite high. 
150 kilojoules per mole. This is on a bare surface, by the way, so there are plenty of sites around for CO to dissociate. If you ask it instead, what would you do if you found the hydrogen, what would you do? Would you attach yourself to the oxygen in that CO, and what would be the consequences? And when you do that, the answer is no. I don't want to have anything to do with the oxygen part of the CO. I would rather, in this case, dissociate if I have an empty site. Never mind that it may not find that empty site. It may have no choice but to react with the hydrogen. The fact is that it is higher in energy. But it turns out that if you ask it what it wants to do with the carbon end of the molecule, if it found the hydrogen around, not only is it more likely to find the hydrogen than an empty site, but when it does that, it has a quite reasonable activation energy, which is less than 100 kilojoules per mole. So CO would actually much prefer, even on an empty surface, okay, to actually react with the hydrogen to give you a species that, of course, needs to go beyond. This clearly will weaken the carbon-oxygen bond, okay, and may make it easier to dissociate the CO. So let's look for a moment at what this intermediate may do next as a result of having been formed by the lowest energy path in this part of the chemistry. Well, let's look at that species right there. Let's put her on the surface and ask it, what would you do if you found yourself on an iron surface and you had a hydrogen around? Well, one thing that it may do is react with that hydrogen and dis dissociate. In other words, one thing that it will do is attach to the oxygen uh, part of that um, of, of that molecule and effectively they break up into pieces and the path is a fairly high activation energy. It doesn't like to do that. If you now go and take the same molecule and you say, well, how about the, the carbon part of the chemistry, okay? You will go to the carbon part of the chemistry and this is what that energy diagram will look like and the activation energy begins to be quite reasonable. And then if you ask you, what do you really want to do? Even if you have hydrogen around, what it tells you is that it really wants to break up without adding any more hydrogen. And in fact, that would be inconsistent with our kinetic data. Because in order to be able to get a first order dependence in hydrogen, you need to wait until the second hydrogen goes on before you actually dissociate. So theory appears at this point to be inconsistent with the experiment. And of course, given that I'm the experimentalist, I'm going to question the theory. Right? So there was a long discussion that ensued at this point about whether the experiment or the theory were correct, and at least the experiment was reality, okay? And the experiment did have a feature that the theoretical treatment did not have. And that is that even though this is the preferred pathway on a clean surface, the surface is actually covered with carbon monoxide during the reaction. So what we really need to do is we need to go back to our iron surface and put a significant amount of CO on that surface and see whether the conclusions actually end up being different than the one that appears to be inconsistent with the experiment. If we're still inconsistent with the experiment, we have to go back and do the experiment again. That was the agreement that we had between the two groups. So the first thing that you do in this case is you take an iron 111 surface, you begin to put CO, and of course, as you would expect, the heat of absorption decreases as you have the CO to pack closer and closer to other CO's on that surface. It is very difficult on a slab type calculation to actually put much more than about three quarters of a monolayer because the CO has no way to move away from each other and avoid the dipole-dipole repulsive interactions. So what we're going to do is we don't claim to be reflective of a real catalytic surface and reaction conditions, but we're going to see whether putting half a monolayer layer of CO changes any of the conclusions that we have reached up to this point. So we begin with a CO on the surface that has some hydrogen around, and the way that this is going to be done, again, if I may go for a moment, is we're going to put a half a monolayer layer fully relaxed set of spectator CO, and then we're going to ask one of the COs effectively what it would do in that situation. The surface has hydrogen, but it also has still some empty sides around. If you look at the dissociation of CO, it will not go. It will not break by itself on that surface. If you look at the hydrogen assisted through the oxygen part of that molecule, you have quite a significant activation energy for that step. If you attach it to the carbon, as we saw before, you actually get a very reasonable activation energy. So what we're going to do is we're going to stick to the same path that we had before. This one right here and the form of group. So here's the step that appears to be preferred. This is what happens. It wants to dissociate again. We seem to have a problem. And that is that it still, apparently, has a, fairly, a perfectly fine path for dissociation. However, if you look at the addition of the second hydrogen, it's quite favorable, but then you're stuck. You can't get past that point, and therefore that one is not going to get you anywhere. 
or you can go down this way and attach it to the oxygen side, and then you're going to have two consecutive low activation energy paths to get all the way to the rock. This at least gives you the possibility of having this one and this one, and this is the one that would be consistent with the experimental data. So the next argument goes as follows. If you are CO and you are on the surface, you will find the hydrogen and do this, and you will find an empty site and you will do this. What is the probability that you will find the hydrogen in an empty site on that surface? Well, these are the two rates of those two reactions. This is what you would get for the ratio of this path to this path. And of course, this ones will cancel, and you will be left with a ratio of hydrogen to three sites. This is nothing more than the Henry's law limit for the absorption of hydrogen, and at the 20 atmospheres of hydrogen and with the binding energy of hydrogen, this number is going to be much greater than one. Why does it react with another hydrogen? Because there are very few sets of empty sites around to be able to do the other path. So now at least there is no inconsistency, and this appears to be the preferred path. The second addition of hydrogen occurs by this mechanism. Um, don't, uh, don't get dizzy looking at what the hydrogens are doing in this case. All that I want to indicate here is that this appears to be the preferred path. You add one hydrogen to the carbon end, you add another hydrogen to the oxygen end, and then the it finally breaks down at that point on that surface. Okay, now we go back to the experimental data, and we consider the case of iron in which you can either go by the blue path, which is the hydrogen activated part, or the red path, which is the CO dissociation without any assistance by hydrogen. And you begin to look at the rate expressions for the formation of hydrocarbon. Blue and red corresponds to blue and red here. And you begin to calculate the constants that go into that equation. Here's what, uh, what the uh, parity plot looks like. This is what the two values of the two groupings of constants that you have here are. There's something else that you can do. You can look at the rate of carbon dioxide formation, and if it came only from the red, it has to be equal to that, right? And then you can calculate, in fact, be the numbers for the, you can calculate the same number two different ways, showing you that this one corresponds to that one, and this one, which is the water, corresponds to that. Those two numbers are the same, those two numbers are the same within the experiment period. So everything that obeys this rate equation in the overall combined effects is actually going to work, and that one is going to uh, CO2. And this, as you remember, the ratio of these two is in excellent agreement with the experimental data. Okay, now, can we test this further? If indeed we think this is the rate of uh, formation, and that this one corresponds to hydrogen assistant, and this one corresponds to the other one, we can do the following experiment. We can do a kinetic isotope effect. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure the rate of hydrocarbon formation, and of water formation, and of CO2 formation in hydrogen and CO and deuterium and CO. This is hydrogen and CO. This is the value. This is deuterium and CO. This is unusual, but it's actually quite accepted in freezer probes. It has an inverse isotope effect as opposed to a normal isotope effect. The reaction is actually faster with deuterium than it is with hydrogen. Now, this kinetic isotope effect, if you look at it carefully, will come from any of the steps. Okay, let, let's do it this way. Here's the CO2 um, um, formation rate. This is the CO conversion. That is the rate with hydrogen and CO. And this is the rate for deuterium and CO. And there's no kinetic isotope effect in the case of this particular term. Now, notice that the mechanism that we have proposed, the blue ones here, are for particular steps that have hydrogen. In other words, what you expect either a thermodynamic or a kinetic isotope effect. The black ones are the ones that do not have hydrogen, and therefore you could never have a kinetic or a thermodynamic isotope effect. There is nothing in the CO2 rate that has hydrogen, and therefore there cannot be a kinetic isotope effect, and indeed there isn't one within our ability to measure. These ones here have plenty of terms that can give rise to that isotope effect. There is a K2. This is the thermodynamic hydrogen effect. There is a K as six, which is a thermodynamic effect, and a K7, which is a kinetic effect. You can go back to the theory and you can ask it to calculate now, based on this, what would be the expected kinetic isotope effect for the particular mechanism, and this is what you calculate from the theoretical calculation. The surprising thing actually is that most of that isotope effect is not kinetic in nature. 
It actually came from a thermodynamic isotope effect for hydrogen adsorption. The reason why there is an inverse kinetic isotope effect in tritrotropes is because deuterium binds more strongly than hydrogen and it's almost strictly a thermodynamic effect rather than a kinetic effect. Okay, now the last three slides, and then I'm done, or four, are going to show you that there's something that we can now explain as to why cobalt is different. And actually, cobalt is different only in certain ways. The kinetic rate expression for cobalt in this case is actually not very different than the one from iron. So you have a mechanism that could actually be given to you by this path, because the surface is covered with CO, one CO cancels the square, and you have a hydrogen to CO ratio. But what you also know about cobalt is that it does not form CO2, right? It forms only water as the debris. So what that would require in the context of this mechanism is that we cross that term out and we cross all the red steps. In other words, cobalt could only go through a non-dissociated path when you use hydrogen in order to aid the dissociation of CO. Well, what that means is that we need to go back to those steps that we proposed for iron and see how reasonable they are in the case of cobalt. And we do that the same way that we did previously. But before I tell you anything else, this is the kinetic isotope effect. It is an inverse kinetic isotope effect. It comes mostly from the thermodynamic effect of, of hydrogen. But what happens if you begin to do simulations? Here is CO now on cobalt. On cobalt, there is no question. There is no carbide. It is cobalt metal during the reaction. The surface is mostly covered with CO. And you begin to ask it, would you please dissociate? And it says, there is no way I'm going to dissociate on CO. CO and cobalt. CO dissociation on cobalt will have to go to a huge activation barrier in order to do it. This is problem number one. Problem number two is if you put an oxygen on cobalt, you're never going to get it off that surface with hydrogen at any reasonable conditions. So whatever you do, don't dissociate, because if you do, you're not going to be able to remove that oxygen after you do it. If you ask it to attack the oxygen, it will do that, and the activation energies begin to be quite a bit more reasonable. And by the way, this is on a CO-saturated surface. This is not on a clean surface anymore. If you tell it to go after the carbon, you said, yeah, that probably is not unlikely to happen at reasonable temperatures. And therefore, either one of those two is likely to be able to do that. Notice that our kinetics cannot distinguish where the hydrogen is going. The only requirement for kinetic consistency is that we attach one hydrogen, and then we attach another hydrogen. We cannot tell which one comes first from the dynamics. So either one of them could be going up. So here are the two possible paths. You have two ends of the molecule, which one do you put the hydrogen on? Well, if you put it here, you're stuck, okay? because you cannot go to the next step. If you put it here, you can actually proceed further along that path, and then you can actually proceed further to get there. But you can also take that molecule and add a hydrogen to it, and at the end, you're gonna end up with a formula that we had there before. In iron, you tend to go one way. On cobalt, you tend to go the other one. But at the end, you are in the same end product. And this has no great difficulty decomposing at that point. So this is not unreasonable for cobalt, as it was in the case of iron. And in this case, it may also explain why it is that on cobalt, you actually never use the CO in order to remove the oxygen as CO2, because apparently you've already set yourself on a path to actually form hydroxyl groups rather than O-star on that surface. Finally, I want to show you just what happens to the CO dissociation between these two metals. Okay. In this case, you have iron. It has a very high activation energy, and it also has you know, an almost thermonuclear reaction. CO dissociation of cobalt is actually uphill thermodynamically and unattainable from the standpoint of an activation barrier. Mechanisms that claim that CO dissociates on cobalt before it actually reacts with hydrogen may very well be consistent with the kinetic rate expression, but they require two miracles, in my view. One of them is you dissociate CO on what is a fully covered surface. Miracle number one is you have to find the site. Miracle number two is you have to overcome a high activation energy. And miracle number three is you have to react the oxygen away, something that is extremely difficult to do with hydrogen on cobalt metal surfaces. Finally, um, I want to remind you of, of what it is that we have done. We have taken the possibility that red and blue actually are taking place, and on iron we find that both of them do. And this one here becomes increasingly important as you go to higher and higher temperatures, and therefore 
except for the fact that we are on a very active catalyst at low temperatures, you will get reasonable contributions from the two pack. And you will get CO2 and water as the end product of your oxygen rejection. If you go to cobalt, you actually can remove all of the red ones. You can explain the entire path, including the absence of CO2 and the kinetic rate expression and the kinetic isotope effects by saying that only with the addition of hydrogen to a CO can you actually proceed further and form what will ultimately become the monomer in the chain growth in the fission flow synthesis. So I'm done. These are my conclusions. I turn what was going to be a fairly large problem with very exciting new catalyst into a small problem because I think it has been around long enough that it's worthwhile to at least bring it up from arguing. This began with fission and probes and the carbide mechanism. It moved on to various types of oxygenated intermediate and it sort of has never narrowed down into a specific final suggestion as to what is baby. This is my suggestion for how it may be taking place. There are two activation paths, unassisted and assisted on iron. There's only a hydrogen assisted route that would explain all of what we have found in the case of cobalt based catalyst. And the hydrogen assistance removes two kinetic hurdles. The first one is in the dissociation of CO. And the other one, which I have not shown you in the simulations, is actually what do you do with an oxygen on a cobalt surface if you manage to put it there by dissociating CO? And the answer is you're not going to be getting, able to get it off that surface, and the catalyst will oxidize, and you will not be able to reduce that catalyst at reaction conditions. Oxygen removal is difficult. It's extremely difficult on both iron and coal, and whether it leaves as hydrogen as water or CO2 is set very early in the mechanism. It is set at the point where the surface decides whether it's going to form an oxygen, in which case it gets removed as CO2, or it's going to form a hydroxyl, in which case it will be removed as water. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the collaboration between my group and the group of Manus Mabrikakis. This is a place where all the the theory and the experiments sort of gave up on what they could do on their own, and by coming together, at least we have some arguments as to what a real surface looks like and what it should do under catalytic conditions. The support has come from the Department of Energy. This is also an illustration that when it makes sense to work together, we don't have to be funded together. It turns out that those are two different, two different DOE grants that never had any connection. The connection was intellectual and it came because we both needed each other in this particular case. And finally, the computing services that have allowed what are, as I understand, state-of-the-art simulations of a level of complexity and computational power that has really put an awful strain on many of the supercomputers in order to do those calculations. Thank you very much.
pure ion, not ion carbide, which we heard on the previous lecture. No. What, I, what I said earlier was that these materials work as ion carbides. The surface of those ion carbides are significantly metallic in nature in order to be able to do hydrogen dissociation and CO reactions. So we have not looked at subsurface carbon yet. That's something that we're going to do in the simulations. This is done on a fully covered CO surface, okay, um, um, iron surface, but it is not a carbon. Whereas the real material is the carbon. In the case of cobalt, the real material is a metal and the simulation is a metal. Cal Pathology, BYU. I think your arguments are almost uh, convincing, yes. But I uh, do have one question. That is, a few years ago, uh, we did an interesting experiment, a set of experiments with Wayne Goodman. Uh, one of my students uh, evaporated cobalt onto a tungsten 100 surface, and we got quite a bit of stretching of the the cobalt lattice, the, the monolayer lattice. And we found that uh, that surface would, in fact, dissociate carbon monoxide at room temperature. In other words, it was a sip. We've also found in our other TPD studies on cobalt, aluminum catalyst, polycrystalline cobalt, if you will, that, that you can get uh, facetal CO as uh, 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 dissociation at temperatures below uh, what you, know, uh, you would, would see for the reaction. It's a, it's a very good point. I, I think that there, there are two things that, that clearly um, are going to be important. Anything that makes cobalt unhappy, okay, um, will actually make it more willing to dissociate CO. So clearly edges and corners, for example, in a small cobalt particle may actually dissociate CO. But we also know that the Fischer-Tropsch synthesis, at least in my hands, over a wide range of particle sizes, does not seem to care very much how many edges it has. So the one-on-one -on -one surface is, I think, not an inappropriate uh, uh, sort of facsimile of what the actual working surface may be. But if you stretch the cobalt, if you make it unhappy in any way, if you put it in a corner, clearly it's going to increase the binding energy of CO and oxygen, I mean, of carbon and oxygen on that surface, and make it more likely that it will dissociate. Um, I wish we knew what the actual surface is during reaction conditions. You, you heard my, maybe you heard my earlier comment about how there is probably restructuring uh, that goes on when you get the CO absorbed on the surface. There, there could be, the, but, but it would be then malicious to, to have the reaction be so insensitive to the size of the particles that we work with. And we have now extended the structure insensitivity to about four nanometer cobalt particles, and we still can see no differences in the turnover rate. Mm -hmm. So if it roughens, it should be extremely sensitive to what the size of the particle is. And we cannot see, we cannot detect any sort yeah. of sensitivity. Well, uh, what I'm thinking is that regardless of particle size, you restructure to the same surface structure during reaction. <laughs> Silence. Any other question? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, this is Bill Supermarket from Marty. Could you please comment on the effect of uh, hydrogen to CO ratio on the hydrogen removal selectivity? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure that I can give you the number, but I gave you both the hydrogen and the, the CO. So. I mean, I don't want to go that far back, but you can look at, two, at the two of them individually and reach your, your respective conclusions. Um, um, okay, probably this is as good a place to do it. So here you have what, what the effect of CO is at this hydrogen pressure. Here you have the effect of hydrogen at that CO pressure. So hydrogen doesn't have, uh, CO doesn't have an effect on the ratio of water to CO2. And Hydrogen has a linear dependence. So I mean, there, there is an equation that, that sort of tells you, just take the ratio of those two, and that gives you the selectivity for the oxygen. It is much better, by the way, there, there are two issues with doing that. One of them is you need to extrapolate to get the primary. These are primary oxygen removal rates. Most experiments in the literature are corrupted by secondary reactions. So you need to extrapolate to zero contact time. The other one is you should not look at selectivity in percents. Okay, you should look at it as the ratio so that you can get an oxygen selectivity, which we seldom report in the fission process. 